I am all for anything that helps the most amount of people, but I want to move to like a commune that has like a farming co-op and I want to have chickens. So I'm not like a lot of people, but um, I like the idea of a collective. Like that's something that I like, not like the Borg or anything like of one mind, but like, you know, but, um, and I think people have a really hard time with that. And especially in this country, you know, we, we are not even used to the idea of, being responsible for our neighbor's health care. Like that's such this foreign um, concept to us in this country. Yeah, we're it, so me, me, me. And, it, and, it's and not, it needs uh, to change. Yes, it does. And it, But it's not, it, you know, it's not biological. It's not that we're different from other. It's not that. So what is it? It's largely the culture that we have and markets. Markets are a system in which people basically get ahead at the expense of other people right you buy cheap and sell dear you try and rip off the other or you try and profit off the other and the incentives are all horrible so in other words if you're a company you have an incentive to dump your pollution on the neighborhood if you can get away with it and if you don't you get out competed because somebody else does and so there's a tremendous pressure to behave in a manner which you're describing. It's antisocial. It's it's basically individualist, not in the best sense, but in the absolute worst sense. And that's one of the other key things about participatory economics. It, it, it is a step between, the step between is how much stuff do you get and on what basis, okay? Uh, that's the next part of participatory economics, you could say. and. Uh, We've already gotten rid of owners, so you're not going to get income for property. So that's gone. Uh, We we are balanced job complexes. That's the situation of overcoming that division between the empowered and the disempowered in the workplace. That essentially gets rid of bargaining power because it's all the same for everybody. In a market system, your income is really a function of bargaining power. So in other words... If you have a monopoly on something, you have a lot of bargaining power. In fact, if you have a union, you have more bargaining power than if you don't. If you're in a sexist society and you're a man, the sexism causes women to have less bargaining power. You do better as a man. And so on and so forth. That's gone. The power, the, the property thing is gone. There's, you know, there's a, a another couple of possibilities but I'll tell you the one that participatory economics opts for. It opts for the idea that your income should be a function of how long you work, how hard you work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which you work. And that's all. So it's not a function of your bargaining power. In fact, there's no differences in bargaining power. But it's also not a function of the value of your product. So in other words, if you happen to produce something really valuable and somebody else produces something that's desirable and that's useful, but not as valuable. The first one doesn't earn more than the second one. You don't earn by virtue of the value of your output. And these are important factors because we don't want to reward people because they're born with a particular talent, right? If you're born able to sing like Adele, or you're born with Chomsky's brain, or you're born with Steph Curry's, whatever the hell it is he has to let him shoot like that, right? We don't think that you should be on top of luck in the genetic lottery, that you should be rewarded even more piled on top of that. So it isn't just property that shouldn't be rewarded. It's these kinds of differentials. And then the last step for participatory economics, of course, we're going sort of quick, but okay. Uh, The last step is you can't have markets or central planning. If you have central planning, then basically you've got a system in which you've got uh, authorities, which are basically issuing orders that are being obeyed. We had a great guest a few months back who is a conservative. Her name is Carol Roth, and she wrote a book, The War on Small Business. The highlight of the book was talking about the difference between centralized planning and decentralized planning. We have a serious problem with centralized planning in this country. Uh, You know, New York City, Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, you know, Austin, Texas. All the blue places. All the super blue places. Yes. And as you have said, and Chicago probably being number one, uh, 
people are not meant first and foremost to live on top of one another. Yeah. And that is a very big problem. Yeah. And down here, it's you know, multi-story. It is. It's bad. Down uh, here, where are you guys? South Florida. So, ah. you know, we're we are in the the Sunshine State, and so we're watching you know, saltwater um, intrusion and corrosion of the concrete that led to the falling of that Champlain Towers in Surfside. That's going to start being a major problem and, down here yeah. all along the coast. And, and what's even these worse, are yeah. and these what's are even all, worse, we saw okay. it coming. Yeah. And we saw it coming yeah. because this was a case where, you know, when Jen had run for Congress in 2020, you know, we were going to the city commission meetings and Surfside really stood out where people were saying there's saltwater erosion. This yeah. is a real problem. And they didn't do anything. They about couldn't it. have. That's the other thing, because even if they wanted to, they do not have the money to remedy. The, the federal government has got to f fix this infrastructure. It is not something that these homeowners can afford to do, even if they want to, they can't afford to and, do and it. And that I think is the embodiment of the fact that our government has been completely captured yeah. by corporate special interests. That's that's the order. But there's nothing surprising about that, and there's nothing new about it either, right? It's right. what we're saying, ultimately, is that if you have a society in which you have a relatively small sector of people, in our case, just a few percent, in the old Soviet case, about 20 percent, if you have a small sector of people who have a, 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 a control they have a monopoly on power, on the levers of, of decision making, and they aggrandize themselves with wealth. Well, all the institutions are going to be beholden to them, are going to be subject to their will. And so that's what you see. So what No Bosses is all about and what uh, participatory economics is all about is getting rid of that. Getting rid of not only the private ownership, because that's not enough, but also getting rid of the that 20% ruling 80%. And central planning is the, is the allocation system which best facilitates the 20% ruling the 80%. So you don't want that. But you also don't want markets for a host of reasons. Uh, markets, not only do they produce the antisociality we talked about earlier, but they ignore the ecology. That is... When there's a transaction in a market system, there's a buyer and a seller. And the buyers and the sellers look at the situation, assess it. They're using their power, bargaining power to try and fleece each other. But they're taking into account their own situation. The situation of the people who are affected beyond them is called an externality and it's simply ignored. It is not taken into account in a market system. So the... You know, the salt water acting on the uh, buildings, which are built in a fashion that is insubstantial for dealing with it, right, is a, is a major problem. But it's a major problem that is ignored um, until it manifests itself in a disaster. Or, on a larger scale, the use of fossil fuels and the you know, the, the violation of the atmosphere in such a way as to threaten all human life, the firms that are doing that, it's not part of their calculation. It doesn't enter into their calculation. And if the issue is to try and do something about it, it costs them. And for them to, for, to make less profits endangers their stature, their position. It threatens their possibility of, of losing. Cool. And so they don't do that. And so you need to replace markets and you need to replace central planning. And what participatory economics comes up with, I'll bet no surprise, is something called participatory planning. And it is really decentralized planning. There's no center. There's no top. There's no uh, you know, authoritarian sector of it. It is workers and consumers cooperatively planning their own circumstances. Uh, we're, speak we're speaking with Michael Albert, an author of No Boss is a New Economy for a Better World. Is there an example anywhere in the world that you would highlight as a good barometer to measure? For and obviously, we're going to have to say in history as well, because there might not be something existing. That's currently. probably true. Yeah, no, there's no country that has a participatory economy. And there's no um, 
big industry. There are small firms that do it, small operations, small businesses, um, not a ton, but there are, you know, there are some. Uh, and that would seem like an argument against it, except for one thing. And I used to say this 50 years ago. There was a time when everybody was illiterate. Not a few people, everybody. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be illiterate forever. There was a time when everything was feudalism. That didn't mean feudalism was forever. There was a time when everything was capitalism and not even what I call coordinatorism, what others call 20th century socialism. Things change. And your earlier discussion, you, you know, your earlier, um, I don't want to use, <laughs> um, <laughs> your, I won't call it a rant, but it was a good rant, right? Your, your earlier um, uh, description of how bad things are is real and something has to happen. And either what's going to happen, the truth of the matter is, either what's going to happen is we're in for a very dismal future and your kids won't have a future or there's going to be serious change and substantive change. And it's, I guess you could say it's my bet. I don't know what to call it, right? That to have that change needs us to have not even just an economic vision. I also think we need political vision. We need kinship vision for what we're going to do about nurturance and home life and uh, socialization. And we need cultural vision. It's just that I happen to have been trained in economics. And so I worked on that. But it's not because I think it's more important or anything like that. What makes it not Marxist? Let me just answer that one other question yeah. that you rose earlier, okay? Look, part of what Marxism said is common sense, and everybody everybody believes it and knows it now, right? There are owners, there are capitalists. They try and get profit. They they. I mean, everybody knows that, including all business schools, right? So everybody knows that. So that's true. Then there's subtle parts of Marxism that almost nobody knows because it's described in words that nobody understands. So that's the Marxist academics. At the, at the most basic level, the first difference from Marxism, and it's only a difference from, I think, very orthodox and old style Marxism, is that the participatory approach elevates kinship and uh, sex and culture and power, political power, to the same plane of importance as economy. And a lot of Marxists don't do that, although some nowadays do do that. The other thing that distinguishes it is that most Marxists, almost all Marxists, think that there's really two important classes. There's the owning class called the capitalists, and there's the working class. And if the, owner cla the owning class owns, it rules. But if you get rid of that ownership, you're home free. The only thing left is workers and they rule the economy. And it's just not true. Because between labor and capital, there's what we call the coordinator class. People whose, whose circumstances are empowering, whose circumstances convey to them a monopoly on information and knowledge and skills and access to the decision-making levers day to day. And then there's the working class below. And it's 20% and 80%, roughly speaking. And that's the difference. If you rule that out, then there's only one big task. Get rid of private property, right? That's the big task. And some people get rid of it and say you should have central planning. And some people say you should get rid of it and have markets. And nowadays, actually, the latter is the more popular among lots of Marxists. But for us, there's this coordinator class. And this coordinator class will be the ruling class if you have either central planning or markets. And it will also be the ruling class if you keep the old division of labor. So this is why you see these focal points of what this new economic vision says is crucial. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.